Hello, welcome. Um, I'm sorry that we can't all meet face to face uh, during these slightly strange times. And um, I've been asked to talk about uh, alopecia and some of its treatments. My name is uh, Dr. Paul Farrant. I'm a consultant dermatologist uh, based in Brighton, and I specialize in hair loss as well as uh, doing more general dermatology. There are a few disclosures. I am a paid consultant for Eli Lilly, which is a company looking at introducing JAK inhibitors for alopecia in the UK, and I'm advising them on that. I'm also a researcher for Pfizer, doing a couple of JAK inhibitor trials for alopecia, as well as uh, a JAK inhibitor trial for AbbVie for eczema. I also sit on a committee for the British Association of Dermatologists, looking at alopecia guidelines. So during this talk, what I um, have been asked to look at is the different presentations, how people might present to me with alopecia. I'm going to discuss a little bit about what's going wrong with alopecia, and then I'm going to look at the different treatment options available. So alopecia is actually a very ancient disease and was described by Hippocrates. So going back uh, a couple of thousand years, the word alopecia uh, comes from the Greek, alopex was fox and this um, was fox mange effectively where the fox lost bits of hair. Over the time, various patterns have been described. So a physis pattern refers to a snake-like pattern where you lose hair around the sides and the back. And over the evolution of the history of medicine and different ideas, people have come up with different thoughts as to what might be causing alopecia. So as medicine evolved and we started to become aware about parasites, it was thought that parasites could, do to, to, could trigger off the hair loss. In the 19th century, when everything was put down to nervous disorders, it was thought that a nervous disorder was causing the hair loss. As medicine evolved and we started to understand about uh, hormones and hormone pathways, it was thought there was a link between things like thyroid. And of course, late 19th century, early 20th century, when there's lots of poisoning going on and various things, it was thought that poisoning could trigger it. It's also been put down to being linked to eye disease and interestingly linked to teeth. And there's been renewed interest about chronic infection being a possible trigger for alopecia. In terms of common presentations, the, the most typical form are these discrete round patches. The patches are usually shiny bald, so there's no hair, although you might see very short broken hairs around the edge. And there are very few conditions that will lose hair in, the, in this way uh, with very minimal changes in the skin surface. Patches can be very widespread, so they can cover large areas of the scalp. And when the hair grows back, sometimes it starts to grow back white. And in fact, sometimes hair uh, that is attacked is only the pigmented hair. And I'll show you a picture of that. It can become very widespread and involve all of the scalp hair. And we call that alopecia totalis. And sometimes it involves all the hair of the entire body, including eyebrows, lashes, body hair, pubic hair, auxiliary hair, everything. And we call that alopecia universalis. It is effectively all the same condition. It is just different manifestations. Beard hair can be involved and that could be distressing for some people. This is the aphiasis pattern that we talked about at the beginning. So this is the snake-like pattern that goes around the sides and around the back. And that can be a really stubborn pattern uh, to treat. This is almost like the aphiasis, but this is going around the front and we call this marginal alopecia. And in fact, this patient uh, was thought to have a different condition that particularly affects the frontal hairline called frontal fibrosing alopecia. Uh, and was thought to have that for quite some time. And it wasn't until the pattern was a bit odd and she developed other patches that the penny dropped that she actually just had this form of alopecia. And here are other areas which are much more typical. 
Now alopecia doesn't always cause shiny discrete patches and in that situation it's much more difficult to be sure about the diagnosis. So this is more of a diffuse. So you can still see there's quite a lot of hair here growing through. You haven't got the very shiny areas. Um, and there are other things that can do this and it's not obvious it's alopecia but if you see broken hairs you might be more uh, convinced and here we've got shiny patches and here more diffuse loss and, and then put the two together then it's all likely to be alopecia but if you were just met with these patches I think that would be more challenging. It can involve other areas so alopecia when it's quite widespread or quite severe will often involve the nails and the commonest feature are pits of the nails uh, and these may just be one or two it may be infecting the whole nails uh, or you can get these very rough nails where they're all lined uh, and that's called tracheonychia rough nails or washerboard nails Now, when I'm seeing patients with alopecia, we'll often examine with some form of magnifying device, and that just highlights the features uh, up close. And the typical feature we're looking for is something called an exclamation mark hair. And this is, this is an exclamation mark here. Here, um, they're, they're broken hairs that taper as they come to the skin surface. So this is an unhappy hair that has had its disrupted growth and then snaps off. And you see this when the condition is very active. So when you see lots of exclamation mark hairs around an edge, you know the condition is active and probably going to get worse. Another feature of these yellow dots, and these are just dilated follicles where you, you're seeing the opening that's been plugged with keratin, which is, uh, or sebum, um, either one. Uh, so these are empty hairs, if you like. And then sometimes you can see these coiled hairs which might just be beneath the surface and these are fairly sick hairs that are being attacked dystrophic or coiled hairs uh, so this just shows on the left uh, the exclamation mark hairs these tapering as they get to the skin surface and here you can see a mixture of exclamation mark hairs and these yellow dots and some hairs that are just beneath the broken off beneath the surface so this is all very active alopecia and again here, sometimes called cadaverized or dead uh, hairs underneath the surface. So there are some interesting observations in alopecia. Um, there are various reports in history of patients going white overnight. So this is Marie Antoinette on uh, her way to the guillotine. And she apparently went white overnight. And one of the explanations for this, that it, it was alopecia areata. Now, alopecia attacks pigmented hairs. And it's thought that the pigment cells or the pigment itself is related to the immune attack. So patients who have pigmented hair may get all the pigmented hair attacked. And if they've got some white hair there that remains and that's what's thought to go on in these patients that go white overnight all the pigmented hair is attacked and comes out all the white hair is not attacked and stays and therefore they go from uh, their previous color to looking like they're white uh, very quickly we know that alopecia is often worse in atopics atopics are patients who suffer with asthma hay fever and eczema and it's eczema in particular that seems to be related we know that atopics probably have a, a worse course or are slightly more resistant to treatment we know that certain patterns are more challenging and are more resistant to treatment so the aphiasis pattern and then the more widespread patterns like totalis and universalis there have been various studies, um, particularly by Italian groups that have looked at patients over many years, over decades. And what they have shown is that a lot of patients do unfortunately gradually get worse over time. So patches becoming more numerous or more widespread, a, a general evolution. But the evolution to total loss is actually uh, relatively uh, small, probably around 10% to 15% at, at worst. 
There is a link with other autoimmune conditions, particularly thyroid disease. Um, it, it doesn't mean that you're going to get thyroid disease, but you are probably at slightly higher risk. And having thyroid disease doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get alopecia. But there is a link, and that is probably people having a tendency to form an immune reaction against their self, and that's what's going wrong with the thyroid, and that's what's going wrong with alopecia. Interestingly, we all want to know what's triggered it off. And really, less than 10% of the time, there is an obvious trigger. So sometimes there will be. I've had various patients over the years. I had a, a, a doctor, and every time he did a medical exam, he would get new patches of alopecia. Uh, and then in between time, it would all grow back. And then sure, as clockwork, next time he did an exam, it would go. I've had patients who've had severe car accidents, suddenly lost all their hair. People have had major life events happen and suddenly it happens. But actually that accounts for probably less than 10%. So that means that 90% of people, there is no obvious trigger. There's nothing going on. They've not had any infections. There's nothing majorly upsetting them in any way that can be clearly attributed to the onset. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's going on and try and keep this relatively simple. So this is a hair follicle. And a hair follicle is a tube-like structure and the skin surface would be up here at the top. And then the follicle is going quite deep into the skin, goes all the way through the skin layers into the fat if it's a nice big follicle. And the bit we care about is this bit here called the fiber and this sticks out the surface and we all care about this, but this is actually a dead keratin material. What's important is what is going on beneath the surface. And your hair fiber is the product of these cells down here. And these are called the matrix cells. So these are dividing cells. And as they divide, they create a new hair uh, fiber that pushes up. And it's surrounded by different sheaths of skin. And then you've got the surrounding uh, dermis of the skin. And this bit down here, this slightly bulbous bit is called the hair bulb. And this is particularly relevant in alopecia. It's not only the part that generates these dividing cells that generate the fiber, but this is the area that your body seems to attack in alopecia. So the other thing to know about the hair follicle, so this is just it in a, in a cartoon diagram, is that there is a permanent bit, a top bit, and a, and a semi, uh, and a non-permanent bit, if you like, a, a cycling bit. And in life, this is a growing follicle here. This will stay like this for uh, normally for five, six, seven years, something like that. And then at the end of that, it will go through a shrinkage phase. And then it will, after a few months of staying in that shrunken stage, doing not very much, it will start to grow again. In alopecia, what happens is your body starts to attack this bit down at the bottom. And that causes the hairs to go into the shrunken stage and stay there because that stops them being attacked. It's only the growing hairs that get attacked. And then after a few months, your body will start to try and grow a hair. And one of two things is going to happen. Either your body sorted itself out or you've had some treatment that seems to have sorted things out and the follicle can start to grow again or your body is primed to attack it. It starts to grow and it gets attacked and gets shut off and goes back into this regression phase. So everything here is the bit that disappears. So these are the growing phase, sits here for five, six years. Then it shrinks, this bottom bit shrinks, all of this shrinks. This is the bit where it doesn't seem to do much. And then it will try and get back to the growing phase. And it's this disruption of your hair cycle that is going wrong in alopecia. So why does it go wrong? Well, I'm not going to go into all the details. It's obviously quite complicated. But effectively, it's almost like you've got a force field around the hair. So your immune system is constantly going around the body looking for danger. It's looking for nasty bacteria, viruses, parasites, you name it, it's looking, and it's there to protect you. There are various structures in the body that we try and hide from the immune system. 
so the immune system does just not get involved. And uh, one of them is the eye, the other is the, the central nervous system, the brain. Uh, and the, another one is, is a hair follicle. And there are very clever mechanisms that it achieves this, but effectively think of it like a force field. And as long as that force field is intact, your body's immune cells that are constantly going around do not see the hair follicle. They're basically just, they aren't aware of it being there. And what goes wrong in alopecia is that you lose the force field. So suddenly your body's immune cells will start to see a follicle and they'll think, oh, I've not seen that before. And they start to form an immune response and attack it as if it's a foreign thing. And it's this poor control of those immune cells. So it's your own body attacking the hair because it's getting it wrong. That then causes the hairs to shrink and go into the, the, the resting part of the hair cycle to try and stop that and sort things out. And this is what happens. So normally there are very few cells around that when that we're not showing uh, the, the, the follicle is not uh, displaying any foreign things. It's not uh, creating an immune response and that disappears. And then suddenly the body's immune cells get attracted into the follicle, especially around this bottom bit. And that that's what causes all the problems. If you look under a microscope, and this is looking at the bulb part, so this is just in a, the way it's been sectioned, we see lots of these dark little purple lumps. And these are, each of these is a lymphocyte, and a lymphocyte is one of your main defense cells. And this is called the swarm of bees. So it's like a swarm of bees all collecting around your hair follicle and the bulb bit at the bottom. And then that's what causes the bulb and the follicle to shrink. And as it shrinks, it, it uh, disappears up like this. Now, it's interesting because alopecia causes a non-permanent hair loss because it's here. Other types of body, uh, when we attack, affect this upper bit and that affects your stem cells and that can cause a permanent loss. So one of the good things about alopecia even though it's a really challenging condition to have and a challenging condition to treat, is that there is potential for regrowth for many, many, many years because the stem cells are right up here and they're away from the area of hair loss. So how do we manage alopecia? Um, and, and how do we know whether it's going to to get worse or whether it's going to be a challenge to treat. And there are a few things that I think can give us some indications. If you have alopecia from a very young age, we know that it's going to be more challenging and that it's highly likely you're going to keep getting episodes of alopecia throughout life. And there are probably a stronger genetic element to people that get it at a young age. But the converse is true. So if you get your first patch of alopecia in adulthood, having never had it before, there's a really high chance that it's going to grow back. We know if you have asthma, hay fever, eczema, or a family history, it's more likely to be persistent. And we know if you have either the hairline or these more severe types, it's going to be more resistant. And then we're going to just come on to treatments and talk about the different options. So the first thing to say is you can do nothing. Uh, and doing nothing is actually not doing nothing. Uh, doing nothing, what I mean by that is making an active decision not to treat with a medical means. It's not doing nothing at all. Um, and that's because we know that if you have a single patch, it will probably regrow if you give it long enough, if you don't have all those negative prognostic factors. And we know that obviously treating it is not always the right thing. Uh, we know that treating can be a bit of a roller coaster ride where you get people's hopes up and you might start to see some hair come back and then it falls out. And sometimes the unpredictability of whether it's coming back or falling out is actually more challenging to live with than accepting where you are or having some means of, of coping with the alopecia. And also we know that for, for children, for example, you know, coming to hospital or having treatment can be pretty disruptive for their schooling, uh, 
uh, it, it's medicalizing a condition, making them a bit nervous about hospitals, and that can that cannot be a good thing. But doing nothing is not doing nothing. Uh, there's obviously a lot of education that can be given. There's support uh, either in in schooling, talking to teachers, um, talking to classmates, uh, psychological support, and of course there are other things in terms of camouflage and, and covering up uh, the alopecia. Camouflage comes in many forms. I'm not going to go into this. I'm sure there's going to be lots of talks about camouflage, um, but you know, patches around the hairline, there are some makeup products that can really disguise the pinkiness of the scalp. And that's what, what people worry most about because that's the bit that makes it obvious. So if you can disguise the shininess, the color change, that can be really useful. Uh, things like eyebrows can be tattooed, microblading, uh, semi-permanent tattoo replacement. Um, and of course you've got scarves and wigs and various hair systems, interlace systems and, and the like that can help you cope. So these are the non-medical approaches, which I'm sure there'll be lots more talks on. And then I think you've got two ways of thinking about different treatment options. You've got the, the kind of obvious thing, which is your, your immune system is overworking. It's attacking the hair. So can we dampen that down? Can we suppress it? Can we try and get the immune system to not attack the hair? And that seems very logical. It's overworking, let's suppress it. Um, and yes, and I'm gonna come on and talk about those. But interestingly, there is another approach. And the other approach is stimulating the immune system in the skin's surface and diverting the immune system away from the follicle. So it's positively stimulating the surface, usually with some form of chemical to create a reaction and that might be a mild eczema, a mild irritation, something that your immune system is gonna be triggered by. And the, the theory is that those immune cells that were attacking the hair now are diverted to the skin surface to find out what's going on, to sort out that, to repair the damage. And that allows the hair follicles to recover. And there are effectively two forms. Uh, there's one called an irritant immunotherapy and another one which is an allergic. And irritant is something that everybody would get uh, a reaction to a classic example i suppose if you had a cup of bleach and we put our hand in a cup of bleach we'll all get a really sore hand and we use an irritant chemical called dithranol which is used as a psoriasis treatment and the the idea is you can build up the strength build up the amount of time you keep it on the skin so 20 minutes for a week every day for a week 40 minutes every day for a week then maybe up to an hour and you might increase it and keep on going up up to two hours and then you might increase the strength so we've got a 0.5%, a 1%, a 2%. And slowly you get to the point where there's a mild irritation, a mild eczema, and you maintain that. It's not the easiest uh, treatment. It does stain the skin a sort of purpley brown color. Obviously it's creating an irritation that's difficult if you wear wigs. Um, and it's a bit messy and you've got to wash it off. Um, so it's not the easiest of treatments, but for some people it's certainly uh, an option. The other way you can do it is generating an allergy. Now, an allergy is specific to the individual and it requires a slightly different approach. So phase one of uh, allergic treatment is you've got to sensitize, you've got to make that individual allergic. And we use a, an artificial chemical called diphencyprone. And we put on a high strength, a 2% strength, and you might have a 10 p coin size area done to your sort of inner aspect of your arm pop it on, pop a plaster on, leave it on for two days or so. Within a week, your body will have developed a specific reaction to that chemical. And every time you come into contact with that chemical, you are going to react to it, but only you, because only the one person has been sensitized. And that means that we can use that sensitization to generate a slightly more sophisticated reaction uh, so phase two is trying to work out where you're going to react. And we start on a really, really weak strength, uh, 0 0.0, 1. Sometimes we use 0 .0, 0 0.0, 1. So tiny, tiny, tiny strength compared to the original sensitization strength. And we paint that all over the areas of alopecia and we see what happens. And uh, either you will react and get a mild irritation with that strength or you get no reaction or maybe you get too strong a reaction. And based on that, we then go up or down. 
Uh, usually from that sort of strength, we'll be going up to 0 0.01, 0 0.05, 0 0.1, to wherever the level is right, where you get a mild irritation that lasts a few days, ideally. And this is done normally as a weekly treatment. At that point, you might continue on that, just keep going back and having that treatment. Uh, but certainly within the NHS, I know most NHS services cannot cope with that and they will see you less frequently and it doesn't really work that way. So if you can only be seen once a month, it's unlikely that these weak strengths are going to help your alopecia. But if you can get in weekly, then it's a really good option. Um, what I tend to do is, is try and then educate uh, the patient and preferably a carer to apply this treatment at home so they can then maintain it. So we work out the strength that is going to be your strength and then you can maintain that treatment uh, on a weekly basis for as long as you like. And you, you within a few months, will know whether the hairs are going to come back and then hopefully this is a, a long-term strategy. You don't necessarily need to keep doing it weekly, but you just top it up and any new areas you might start to treat and then any areas where the hair is growing back, you start to back off and use every two weeks, every four weeks, whatever it may be. Um, if we look at the alternative approach and just suppressing the immune system, um, steroids have been the mainstay of treatment. So you've got topical steroids, uh, injection-based steroids or oral-based steroids. And these are blunt tools. Topical steroids, unfortunately, are not very effective. You're putting something on the skin surface. And if you imagine the bit that's getting attacked, it's right down at the bottom in that bulb. It's a, a big ask for any steroid you put on the skin surface to get all the way down there. Injection steroids, steroids are fine because you can inject down at that level, but they are painful and they're really only uh, uh, practical for people that have one or two patches or relatively small number of patches. And then you've got oral steroids, which will work uh, for widespread disease um, and it doesn't matter where they are located, but oral steroids have a lot of side effects and you cannot stay on them long term. And one of the problems that you get with oral steroids is you might start off and, and wean down the dose, but when you come off the treatment, you may lose what you've gained. And that, that's the big problem with steroids. Phototherapy is using ultraviolet light therapy. It's not widely used, um, and that's largely down to it being not the most effective and also having potential side effects. You can suppress the immune system with heavy duty immunosuppressors. So medicines we use in transplant medicine like cyclosporin, methotrexate, azathioprine, but these all come with quite a lot of side effects. Um, and then the new class that everyone's heard about is JAK inhibitors, which is a, a, another suppressant, but a slightly more sophisticated one that is trying to stop the autoimmunity uh, that's going on. So just to mention a couple of those tablet-based things. There's quite a lot of interest in methotrexate recently. And methotrexate is a drug we use a lot in psoriasis um, over the last seven, eight years, I suppose it's been used a lot in eczema too. And it is often combined with prednisolone in alopecia. Cyclosporin is a transplant drug to stop people rejecting their kidneys, for example. And again, it's used in alopecia. Um, and you know, th this is not necessarily anything new, but over the last year or two, there've been a few reviews looking back at how effective it is. And, you know, the response rates are anywhere between about a third and two thirds. But when you look at the data, most of these are uh, patients that are combining it with steroids. And interestingly, this is just looking at responses. The red line here is kind of, uh, you know, whether they're responding in a good way or not. And this population is adults and this is children. So methotrexate, which is a drug we'd be a bit more reluctant to use in children anyway, is not working so well. The more these, each of these is a study, the more these are to the right-hand side, the more effective it is. So it does look like adults do better than children. And we know that it works best when combined with prednisolone. Uh, so this is looking at, again, this is, uh, would be no effect with prednisolone and this is with prednisolone and all of them are doing much better when you combine prednisolone. And of course, that begs the question, what is actually working here? Is it the methotrexate or is it the prednisolone or do you need the two together? Um, uh, and I think a lot of the effect is the prednisolone, but I have had patients who have started on both. We've got rid of the prednisolone, which is the steroid that has all the side effects. They keep going with the methotrexate 
and that seems to hold on to your gain. So if you do get hair growing back, it's possible the methotrexate holds on to that better and allows you to get off the steroid, and that's got to be a good thing. Response rates are fairly slow, six to 12 months to really see. So you've got to be committed to trying this for a long time. And these have been difficult uh, things to try at the moment because of COVID. We, we're a bit unkeen about messing around with the immune system that could be suppressing things when there are various infections that could make you unwell. Cyclosporin has been looked at again recently. Um, this is a drug, uh, I mean, these studies didn't really conclusively show great benefit. And unfortunately, we know that high doses of cyclosporin can affect your kidneys and your blood pressure. So I don't think this is going to be a very popular uh, way forward. I just thought I'd show you this slide. So here is the bottom of your hair follicle. And this is the state where your immune system is, is kind of doing the right thing or the follicles are not being attacked. Um, and this is when it goes wrong. And there are various things that go wrong um, which involve your own body's immune cells, the lymphocytes, CD4 and CD8 T cells, so specific types of lymphocytes. And we produce various messengers, as we, these, this is just a cell type that attacks you, but there are signals that either the cell and the follicle and all the other cells are producing. And these signals basically tell your immune system what to do next. Um, and so when you have lots of signals going on, you recruit more cells. So you, you get these T lymphocytes coming into your follicle. They produce different signals. They then attract more of the same cells. So it's like a vicious cycle. The more cells that come in, the more signals they're producing, the more cells that come in. And it goes round and round and round. Now, the important thing is that signals have to work uh, by forming a connection with a cell. And normally that involves a cell surface uh, receptor and then a mechanism, a downstream mechanism within the cell. So this is called a signaling pathway. And in cells, this pathway is called a jack uh, pathway. And these things, which are the culprits, interferon and interleukins, these are just signals produced by cells. They go into a cell and they trigger this jack pathway and that's what attracts more cells and more signals. So the idea is if you can somehow stop this jack pathway, you could stop your recruitment of these cells. And this led to, this is going back a few years now, these newspapers of people that they tried these jack inhibitors in and suddenly they all started growing their hair. This was the original paper. So jack inhibitors have been trialed for uh, off-label. So there were various, they've been in developed for other conditions like rheumatoid and, and various blood disorders. And so people started looking at these, just little cases here and there, nothing really very formal, no big studies. Um, and in the last few years, people have tried to summarize where we're at. And overall, at least 45, but going up to probably 70% plus are responding to these jack inhibitors. So this is much better than your 35, 40% you were getting with any of the immunotherapies or methotrexate or steroids. So this is a, 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 a game changer potentially. It still takes a few months though. It's not gonna be overnight. And actually I think it takes probably about six months from my experience to see whether it's gonna work or not. So it's not a quick, quick thing. There are lots of trials looking at the moment. We're involved with a couple of trials here in Brighton. Um, and we're looking at a chemical with Pfizer, which is a jack inhibitor. Um, interestingly, there are other types of uh, therapy being looked at as well. It's not all about jack inhibitors. There's lots of uh, interest in these. And these are the centers involved with the first Pfizer study and will probably be involved with the second study starting this autumn. So do they work? And I suppose more importantly, will the NHS pay for it longer term or other health authorities? And I think it is a little bit early to say. Um, if we get the dose right, and certainly some of my patients, I don't know in, in clinical trials, I don't know who's on placebo, I don't know who's on the low dose, I don't know who's on the high dose. And so far, I've got a couple of patients that are doing really well. And I've had some that are doing very little at all. And you, you just don't know whether they're placebo or it's the drug. And until we get proper published uh, evidence, uh, we are still not going to know what's going on. However, 
it does look like a certain proportion of patients are going to do really well with these therapies. Um, we do know that you need to carry on. So if you stop them, you lose the benefit. So it is going to be something to get your hair back. And then there'll be strategies which will involve continuing on it, but it may be that you don't need them so often or the dose can be reduced. All of these new therapies coming through are very expensive. And that begs the question then, will authorities pay for it? And that is yet to be answered. As I said, there are a number of drugs. I'm not going to go into what all of these are, but the point is that there's been an awful lot of science looking at alopecia and what's going wrong and what are those individual signals that the cells are producing that keep the process going on and on. And now what people are doing are looking to say, well, there's a lot of this signal. Can we block it? There's a lot of this signal. Can we block that? And so we are going to see over the next five, 10 years, probably study after study looking at each of these mechanisms and which is the most effective, which is the safest. Uh, and then we'll worry about costs. So in summary, alopecia is very common. Uh, it's a, it has a 1% lifetime risk of getting this condition anybody. So it's a pretty common condition. We know that it runs in families. Uh, we really do not understand the triggers. We, we know the genetics. We can test for those in, in research terms. And we know a lot of the genes that go wrong. What we don't know is why, if you're born with certain genes, why do you suddenly get alopecia at age 20 or 30? Well, what's happened at that particular time in your life? And that's the bit we really understand poorly. We know that it is a disruption of those immune follicles. And ultimately what we want to do is to get your immune follicle, your hair follicles back to their normal state where they have their normal force field around them. And the big hope here, I think, is that this new understanding is leading to uh, specific treatments and that is really encouraging. So um, I will put a version of this talk on, on my website. Um, if you just go to my website and look up the patient area, I hope that's been uh, helpful for you.